Red Spotted Newt is a locally owned independent bookstore located in downtown Hazard, Kentucky, specializing in Appalachian literature from authors such as Silas House, Gurney Norman, and Annette Clapsaddle, among many others. The Newt also offers a full collection of art and gifts, including little bubby child prints and these sweet cards inspired by The Office. Check out their store located at 221 Memorial Drive in Hazard or shop online through bookshop.org. And be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram at the handle Red Spotted Newt. Hazard Coffee Company is the sole specialty coffee shop in Perry County. Focusing on high-tech, high-quality coffee and espresso, Hazard Coffee Company seeks to cultivate a community environment around coffee. They have a variety of options, including your favorites, such as mochas and cold brews, as well as specialties, such as the Taxi Alley, always brewed to precise perfection. Stop by their shop located on Main Street in downtown Hazard, or order online for delivery with DoorDash, or at HazardCoffeeCompany.com. good to go all right uh i don't know if i actually really need this it's kind of a <laughs> small venue but uh welcome everyone i'm happy to to see you here um we're here uh today to listen to sam quinones um just to read a little bit about him uh sam quinones is a journalist storyteller former la times reporter and author of four acclaimed books of narrative nonfiction. you probably already know that um his most recent book is The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth, released in 2021, and the book follows his 2015 release, Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic, by Bloomsbury Press. Quinonez's career as a journalist has spanned 35 years. He lived 10 years as a freelance writer in Mexico, uh, where he wrote his first two books, and in 2004, he returned to the United States to work for the LA Times, covering immigration, drug trafficking, neighborhood stories, and gangs. I personally know him from a Christmas present that I received from my mother, uh, Dreamland, which was enthralling uh, and just expertly crafted on how the opiate ep epidemic and the uh, heroin trafficking just intertwines and how our lovely state of Kentucky is 
fairly smack dab in the middle of it. So without further ado, though, um, I would like to present Sam. Sam Quinones. All right, then. Hold on, I'm going to put this right there. And you know what? You guys can be able to hear me just fine. Um, how you guys doing? Everybody good? You know, it's been a long time since I wanted to come out here. Never been able to for various reasons. I've been to Prestonburg, I've been to Pikesville, I've been to, oh my goodness, a lot of towns right all over the map. But you know, I keep on Facebook here lately and just never. Oh, right. Forgot. Forgot. My bad. My bad, sorry to all you folks online there. Um, and so finally I'm able to um, get here. Thank you very much for the invitation, you guys. Josh, Justin, uh, very nice of y'all. Um, I, I thought, <clears throat> Josh and I were talking about this a good while ago. And uh, so what I want to do tonight, normally when I give a talk, it's about one of these two or both of these books and that's fine I'm happy to talk a little bit about them but I also thought that maybe um, I would do something a little different just t tell you a little bit about my own kind of writing career and what brought me here because it's very very far away from everything I know I'm from California as you can tell by my car that's out there um, and uh, ever until I did Dreamland and so, um, so anyway, I just want to talk a little bit about my writing and so on and, and what got me here. And then really any questions y'all have, just throw them out. It doesn't matter what they're about to me um, at all. I'm going to put this here because this is sliding. Um, so I, I guess the best place to start was I got this job in a town called Stockton, California, which is in the Central Valley. California, about six hours north of LA, seven hours north of LA. I was at a, a newspaper, working on a weekly newspaper, uh, a, a section of this one newspaper, and I knew that in order to be a good journalist, I had to get um, experience writing daily stuff all the time, daily, relentless daily stuff. And so I found this one newspaper that looked to me like a good candidate for that. And I applied for a job. And um, I didn't actually know what job it was, just a daily journalism job. And, and they get back to me and say, yeah, we have an opening. You want to come up here and, and, and uh, interview? I said, hell yeah, Head my, headed up there. The reason they had an opening was be, as a crime reporter was the opening. The reason was that the guy before me had been arrested for um, what do you call it? Indecent exposure, in, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Right, seriously, the truth, right? Poor guy, he was a sad case, cocaine habit, et cetera, et cetera. Went to prison for five years, child molestation, indecent exposure, and all that kind of stuff. But that was why they had a, a you know. And, um, and so I took this job, crime reporter in Stockton, which was well known as a town with lots and lots of crime. Um, my dad, see, my, mo my mother was a, elementary school teacher. My father was a literature professor at a university. Um, and he took me aside and says, you know, uh, Sam, um, I'm not sure that's a great job for you because we're not the most like streetwise family, which was absolutely the case. But I took the job anyway, and it changed my life. It was the best job I've ever had. Um, I was the only crime reporter in town. I got to know all the cops. I got to know all the, you know, the hookers on the stroll. Um, I got to, I mean, it was like an amazing job. Just opened to me all these possibilities for writing. And the most important thing it did was it gave me um, relentless writing. You got to write and write and write to be a good writer, I believe now. I wrote four stories a day for about four years and um, about all kinds of car crashes, murders. I did, covered 200 plus murders, I think it was, in my time there. Um, uh, I wrote the, uh, the little uh, the crime log 
which is like in like the small type, you know, and just like burglary here. And one day, it was, it was amazing. I didn't think anybody really read that until I got a call from a guy who said, hey, man, you didn't put my brother in the crime log. <laughs> and I'm like, well, most people don't want to be, you know, people read it would say to, to see, oh, man, I went to high school with that guy. He's now arrested, you know, that kind of thing. And so I was like, why would you want, you know, he says, well, my brother is in jail. And all the guys he's with in the pod think he's a snitch because they didn't see his name in the crime log. And I was like, oh. So I realized then that probably one of the best read parts of the newspaper was that thing that I wrote every day, which I did not understand in initially. So I went to the cops and I said, yeah, yeah, we forgot to put him in. And I said, okay, fine. So I put him in the next day and I'm assuming, I never heard back, but I'm assuming he didn't get the crap beat, beat out of him um, by, these, uh, by, by his, uh, his new roommates. Um, <clears throat> it was in Stockton, I saw heroin, black tar heroin, first time, methamphetamine, I saw meth labs explode. I covered, uh, the f I've, covered, I've covered seven uh, mass murders, rampage murders. The first one was in Stockton, if you look it up, 1989, first one out of school, then AK-47, which led to the ban on assault weapons a few years later. Um, that was four blocks from my house. That was like a searing experience. I worked like 80 hours in five days. And, um, and all these media coming from everywhere. But it was this wonderful experience that every writer needs, particularly every nonfiction writer needs to really solidify and learn how to write. And, and, and when you leave a job like that, you leave with such confidence. Like I could write anything at that point. You know, it's just like nothing would phase me. You know, I wrote three, four stories on deadline every day and, uh, and came out of there also with this great love of crime reporting, which kind of led to these things right here. I mean, I never would have thought I would love it, but uh, I absolutely did have some great uh, editors. And um, <coughs> fast forward a little bit, I went down to Mexico. What I realized was that if I wanted to be a reporter in California, I had to have assets that a newspaper would want, and one of them was speaking Spanish, and I spoke very little Spanish. I went down to Mexico, began to learn Spanish at a community college while I was working nights in Stockton. Eventually, I went down to Mexico a few times to actually take classes, to work. I just wanted to be able to use it in my job because you've got to, this is a knowledge-based economy we're in now, and if you don't have knowledge, if you don't have skills, you, you, you know, you'd be outbid, you'd be outcompeted, and I thought, okay, that's one thing I need to do. And so I did. And then the last time I went down there, I was working by then at another paper, which I don't even want to talk about. Such a drag to uh, that job. But anyway, I went down there, and I was uh, working uh, kind of part-time for this magazine that was published in English. This was right as NAFTA was coming on. And they figured a magazine in English would be, about Mexico would be, have a market. And it was probably, it probably did have some kind of market. And uh, um, anyway, I wa it was March of, 2000, of 1994, and um, I'm in there writing one day. And that, that uh, two days before, they had had one of the biggest events, m events in Mexican history. They had had a presidential candidate from the ruling party for 70 years. There had never been another party in power in this one in, in Mexico. The president who was the, the person who was an anointed the nominee of uh, the party was always going to be president. There was never a doubt in that. And in March of, two, of 94, the presidential nominee was murdered in Tijuana. It was like this earth-shattering thing. It was like the Kennedy assassination, um, except for the guy, was still the guy who did it was still alive. Um, and it was just huge, huge thing. And I go in there, and I'm, so I'm helping them out because they're stressed as a magazine. They're totally stressed. What do we do? How do we do this? And um, I'm sitting in the cubicle, the two editors in one room. My colleagues are all out doing something else. I'm in the office working. And one of the reporters walks in and quits. And I'm like, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was in this little cubicle. She walks in here, around the hair, talks to the two editors who I don't even see it. I know they're there, they're, but I can, I can hear them, of course. But, um, and I'm listening to this, and I'm going, oh, my God. I mean, what reporter quits in the middle of the Kennedy assassination? I mean, you just don't, I mean, it's like the biggest story you're ever going to come upon. And here I was, I was like, 
And I, I watched her. I listened to her, and then I, and I sat there going, oh, my God. And I watched her walk out. And I went, and I closed the door, and I locked the door. And I went to the editors. I said, you need to hire me. Because this is never going to, you're never going to find anybody with more experience. I got seven years experience, more than anybody on your staff. But, I, and plus, I really want to come down to Mexico. I really want to get away from the job I'm working. And I thought this was a perfect time. I always wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I thought being a reporter allowed you to go abroad, cover stuff that nobody else could, could cover. And this was going to be my opportunity to do that. So they did. They hired me. You know? And that would open the door for... I went down to Mexico for, th I always say this, went down for three months and ended up stand, staying for 10 years. I did not mean to stay all that time, right? Um, and it was, but it was more than that. It was this magnificent opportunity to kind of learn new writing skills and see another country. By then, within a year, my Spanish was really good. And ab after 10 years, I was totally fluent, you know? And I began then too, though, to cover stories that had to do with, I mean, there were longer form stories. This is what I want. It wasn't like in writing crime. It's like a story that's this long, you know, eight, 500 words, 300 words, 800, 1,000 words of long story. These were like 5,000 word stories. And I began to write them for magazines. I wrote my first one about this uh, street gang, a bunch of little kids who, you know, there's a lot of issues with migrants going to the North United States. Some of them join gangs, they come back and they bring their gang affiliation with them. And all the kids who've never been kind of view that as their, their connection to the United States, which is this enormous, you know, Shangri-La of a country that they're always hearing about. So all these kids join this gang called Kansas Street. They didn't know what a Kansas was. They asked me, what's a Kansas? How do you pronounce that? Right? And I would hang out with them, I'd, well, you know, it's a state, et cetera, that kind of thing. And they were... They were lost, but it was just an opportunity to write these long-form stories that I'd always wanted to write, but really didn't think I had the ability to do. And frankly, earlier on in my career, I did not have the ability. To, but writing in Stockton and now working in Mexico, it was like a gold mine of stories everywhere I went. There were fantastic stories. And mostly, I did not write about drugs. I wrote about immigration. I wrote about cultural change, I wrote about all kinds of stuff, but not drugs, because that magazine ended at about a year after I'd been there. And after that, I was on my own, I was a freelancer, which is an, another way of saying, uh, you know, starving to death, basically, for a good long time, right? And so I, um, uh, I didn't have anybody backing me up, I didn't have any corporation, media company, big lawyers, none of that, I was on my own. So I just said, okay, I'll leave the dope stories to the, the folks in the, somebody else, somebody who works for the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post or somebody else backup, which I do not, which I do not have. But I still was able to cover a huge, and I thought, in fact, the most important stories were not drug stories in Mexico. It was immigration, huge amounts of people coming north, enormous groups of people, and coming to all parts of areas like Tennessee and Kentucky, various places where there really hadn't been a lot of Mexicans before. And um, I wrote about political change. That ruling party was crumbling, and now there's like this, a lot of political competition, all that. It was a magnificent time. I began to write these long-form stories. One was about a lynching. They had lynchings in Mexico. They, they, they haven't had them for a while, but when I was there, there were many. I have a whole folder like this of lynchings. They're very, very different from lynchings in the United States, which is a uh, white majority trying to keep a, a minority down. In Mexico, it's a bellow from below of people who have been uh, uh, victimized so many times by crime and seeing people go free, or what they believe people going free. Could be both, actually. Uh, they do, or and sometimes it's just a misunderstanding. But whatever the case, so you get these people victimized by crime, overwhelmed by the poverty in which they live, banding together and just lynching people who they believe have killed, have have robbed them, and the two guys that they lynched that I covered were in no way criminals. They hadn't done nothing wrong, but the word spread. They were, in fact, uh, a, a, a salesman going to, door, going to selling toys and stuff um, to various mom and pop grocery stores. And one guy said an off-color remark to a girl, and that blew up, and pretty soon, within a day, they are, they've been arrested as child molestation, as, as a child, uh, not molestation, ch child, uh, 
um, um, piraters. So they, the, the idea being they were going to cut, girl, cut girls open and steal their organs, which is crazy. It's a myth. It never, never happened. But that's what these guys were believed to have done. And so I, those guys were viciously, viciously, brutally murdered by an entire crowd that, that kind of hung them and, and all this kind of stuff. It was just horrible stuff. I also wrote, there was a lot of stuff like that, but there was also many, many stories that were just beautiful. Um, one was a town where everybody in the town makes popsicles. And they developed a business model for making, po guys from this town developed a business model for making popsicles that then spread throughout Mexico and everywhere you go, you will see the business model. It's not a franchise, it's not a company, it's just a, 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 a business model that everybody imitates and you turn p and, and allowed people to go from poor, rural poor to um, middle class, popsicle makers. And that's, and they start these stores all over. But there's this town where the, where the originators, now it's gone far beyond the town, but at the time the town was really the, the place where all the, the, the popsicle makers came from. And, it, and, the, and you, you, I, 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 you, I realized this interviewing them, but then I went to the town, and right in front of the town, I take this cab out to, the, out to this little village because I'm amazed. I'm thinking, this is an amazing story. All these people come from the town. There's popsicle shops literally all over Mexico. There is no plaza in Mexico that doesn't have at least one of these popsicle shops, thousands and thousands of these, these, these things. More, more common than McDonald's by, by, by quite a bit. And they come up there, and, uh, uh, and I w drive up to the town, and there, nobody had told me this. I couldn't believe it. It was like nobody had told me that right in front of the town, they had built an enormous, like as tall as this building right here, two, you know, like two-story, basically, concrete popsicle in honor of what the popsicle had done for poor people, <laughs> which was what Mexico needed, like nine million of these stories, you know, and I'm I only found one, I'm afraid. To say, but, but this was also part of what I also learned that helped me with these two books here, or particularly with Dreamland, I have to say. And that is, when I was in Mexico, I realized, I kept seeing this over and over, and I began to realize it was a thing, that in small villages, tiny villages out in the middle of nowhere, you found villages where everybody did the same job. So a town where everybody makes popsicles. I found a town where everybody owns tortilla shops. I found another tom, t town where everybody became police officers, like literally all the men in town became police officers in different parts of, of, of Mexico. Um, why? Because in Mexico there is not access to education that allows you to go from being a poor farmer's son or daughter to like a mechanical engineer computer software designer, lawyer, doc, and that doesn't exist. So you learn your work from those around you, from your uncles, from your brothers-in-law, all that kind of stuff. And I began to see this was very clearly the case everywhere I went. The biggest example was immigration. Once one guy migrates to Dallas to work in landscaping, all the kids or uh, young men, pretty soon they're all in Dallas working in landscaping because they've all learned this one one, one, one job. It was a, a revelation to me. I did not understand this. And my second book, I wrote, these are, these are my third and fourth books. My first two books, which are on these uh, um, uh, bookmarks, you can see them right there, uh, are all about Mexico. And the second book was literally all about that. It was about all these towns or these places where people had, had moved to, to the United States and then the, the effect on the town back home, wherever they're all from. It's a remarkable thing um, to behold, but after a while I knew it was true. I also knew this, that, w that what they were moving away from was poverty, yes, but equally so, it was humiliation. Because part of being poor in Mexico is having a little, not very much money. But the other part of being poor in Mexico is being humiliated because you don't have a lot of money by people who weren't that much old, uh, the higher on the economic scale than you are. They were poor ones too. In fact, there's a famous t-shirt that I'm kicking myself I never bought in, uh, in LA at a, at, a, at a liquor store. It said in Spanish, la vida recia porque cuando eres pobre te humillan. And it means the fast life, I mean the dope life. 
because when, they, when you're poor, they humiliate you. And so what, what a lot of people were leaving was poverty, but there's lots of people in poverty, and then not all of them leave. The people who are leaving are kind of the ones with gumption, with energy, with drive, and wanting to escape humiliation, not just economic. Obviously, economic you know, deprivation is part of it, but not the only, the only thing. And so I began to see that as well. And one of the things that I noticed was a result of that was that all these guys, after they lived in the United States for a while, they had built homes back in Mexico in their town. Like little homes, like, you know, a three-bedroom three house. But once they finished the first floor, they wanted everyone to know they weren't done. And they put in rebar. Rebar out of the roof. Sticking up, saying this I'm building another story, and everywhere you go in immigrant Mexico, small town immigrant Mexico, you will see rebar. It's like, the, like a, just a sign. I just saw it every single place I went. And uh, after a while, like, it was like, okay, this is just part of the story. I got used to it, you know. Um, I really, as I said, I didn't do much on, on the drug issue. I did do, in my first book, uh, one story, there is literally a ca the, the, the true, there is a, uh, a patron saint of drug traffickers, now obviously not recognized by the Catholic Church, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, you can read it in my first book, a guy named Jesus Malverde, uh, who, who, became, who was a, a kind of a folk saint for poor people in Sinaloa, Sinaloa being the major center of drug trafficking, the state of Sinaloa being the major center of drug trafficking in, in, in Mexico, and those that he Trans, was transformed from a poor person saint into a drug trafficker saint. And they have a big chapel, which you can go, so I've been to five, six times, and you will see all these plaques on the wall. They, now, they used to be concrete, now they're like gold brass and all this stuff, saying, uh, thank you, Malverde, for a mir miracles conceded. Um, and then it'll say something like, Sinaloa to Pomona, Sinaloa to, to, to Dallas, Sinaloa to Oxnard, or whatever, and that's people say, thanking him for allowing their loads of dope to get to go no so I went there and wrote about that in the first book um, the last the second book which neither of which I have here I'm sorry but um, the second book the last story was my last story in Mexico and it was a bizarre tale by then I was used to like being big long stories I loved doing it. it was so fascinating nobody was doing these things all my colleagues were magnificent colleagues very very talented but they were all working for 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 uh, newspapers that wanted them in Mexico City where all the political action was happening I didn't really want to cover that I couldn't compete with them so I was out in the hinterlands constantly and there was it was there that I found out that there's you, you may know or may not that Mexico has a colonies large colonies of German Mennonites in different parts of the country. Um, the first one was just south of Ciudad Juarez, near El pa south of El Paso, about four hours. But there's others. There's five or six of them. The biggest one is right south of El Paso. And what I did not know, they have this image of being very much like, you know, close to God, close to the earth, farmers. They're good. Uh, they gr make great cheese. You always see them with uh, overalls and straw hats selling their cheese in the intersections in Mexico City. You see them a lot, right? And, and I said, and I, so, but then in, I, I discovered, long story how, but I did discover that a lot of these Mennonites were all mobbed up. They were all connected to the Juarez drug cartel and were major um, um, uh, handymen, let's call them, for the Juarez drug cartel because they knew how to make, make false compartments in trucks put dope in the carburetors, all that kind of stuff. And so I figured, okay, this is mine. I was blown away by this. <laughs> and uh, these are old colony Mennonites. There's a lot of Mennonites that are very integrated into modern society. These were the folks who kind of had tried to be apart, right? They had only been driving in that area for 20 years by the time I arrived. I arrived in 2003. It was only in the late, in the mid 80s that they began to get cars. Um, they, they, and, and tractors and, and all the rest. But by then, this kind of mo modernity had kind of corrupted their lives. Long story, um, I did. But, but they eventually got on to the fact that I was um, writing about them. And they, um, I made a few mistakes, but eventually I became, <laughs> I was being chased through 
farmland. I had a little dinky Chevy Love, which is about as like long as that table almost, you know? Dinky little thing. It was the only car I'd ever had in Mexico because I didn't have any money, but the distances were too long, so I rented a car for this one story, and, and it was colored gold. So it like stood out for miles. All these Mennonites were like, oh, the gringo is, you know, <laughs> oh, he's going. They began to follow me, and I don't know if you've ever been followed by someone who wishes to do you harm. It is a scary, scary moment, and I was followed by two cars, D Dodge Stratuses, each with smoke glass windows, no plates, right? And then finally with a, um, by a, tr a, tr a, 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 a Ford 150, olive green. And these guys were, were kind of following me and like monitoring me, taking my picture and all. I drove to the cop, the police department. The only smart thing I ever did really, even though I'm pro pretty sure they were kind of connected in some way. And they call, I call the, um, a, a colleague who calls Vicente Fox's international press secretary. He arranges, and, the, and they literally, the cops caravan me out 60 miles to the airport, or the major capital airport. Um, these two cops, I, I had an AK-47 lying across my, my lap, reading my like last will and testament into my little tape recorder, scared beyond words. You know, it's, it's just a terrifying thing to think, and then they're following us on the, you know, all the way to the airport, and I finally get on a plane. There's the only one plane t that night, and it flies to Mexico City. I get a hotel that night I, at, the, at the airport, and I spend the entire night looking through the people gone, looking for tall, blonde-haired, Mennonite-looking guys, and I eventually made it to Chicago, where my girlfriend, now my wife, is, is, uh, is, uh, was, was living, and, um, but I had then strangely, weirdly, uh, well, maybe not so strangely, not so weirdly, I had a, a terrifying fear of tall, blonde-haired guys <laughs> for like three to six months. When I was writing this book, the story, they, I'd be at like a cafe, you know, in Chicago, and some tall, blonde-haired guy would walk in, and I'd, okay, what? <laughs> I'd push away, and I'd be ready to leap at him, even though this guy's like oblivious to the to the trauma he's inciting in my, in my poor little brain. Um, but that was the last story, uh, I, and that's the story in the, in, these are my two books on Mexico right here. Uh, this is this, this lower book is the, is the one that has the Mennonite uh, story in it. Anyway, um, so I come, I come, I leave, I get a job in LA, I leave Mexico finally after 10 years, amazing, amazing years, I love that country. I love a lot about it. It's a very difficult country. It's a conflicted country. I don't, lo I don't love it only. I hate it and love it. I don't believe anybody can actually only love or only hate Mexico. It's such a wild place, and I, l I, I learned so much. I wrote these long stories. I actually wrote two books. I couldn't even believe that. Um, come back to, m to the United States and um, uh, to work in 2004, and a few years later, I'm put on a team of reporters to cover the drug war that erupts, to my total surprise, down in Mexico. I had not seen this coming. Savagery that we've seen in the headlines for years now. When I, you know, when I was there 10 years, I, I traveled by bus everywhere. I had no problems, ever, except for with those Mennonites once. That was it, right? And now it's like scary thing, beheading, never saw any of that. It was like a, 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 a quiet, decent place, and I'd show up in these small towns to write all about immigration from their town, and people would be like very generous, and yeah, how you doing, man, what, what, why do you want to know that? I didn't, couldn't imagine why an American would ever want to know some of the stuff, but they were happy to talk to me, you know, and then it changed totally. You couldn't go to some of the states where I'd been. Anyway, I was put on a team of reporters at the LA Times to cover the drug war in Mexico, but then also how it affected up here, and, and my job really was to talk about how drugs trafficked across the, across the United States once they crossed the border. And it was at that point that I came connected to this roughly, very generally, this part of, of, the, United, of the United States. I came upon a story in Huntington, West Virginia, which I know is far away, but nevertheless, um, kind of this part of the, air, the, the country, where um, a, 14 people had died in six months in 2007 of overdoses to black tar heroin. Now, I'd seen black tar heroin in the United States, in Stockton, and I knew a couple of things about black tar. 
First of all, it's only made in Mexico in this hemisphere. Second of all, it did not make it across the Mississippi River. It's only on the western side of the United States. You're only in Denver and Portland and Albuquerque, LA, of course, et cetera, et cetera. It's not east of So if all of a sudden it's, it's, in, it's in West Virginia. And West Virginia, I didn't think of it as, as a Mexican enclave. I mean, most people, I mean, I mean this respectfully because I love West Virginia, but most people are leaving Mexico. They're not, um, West Virginia, not coming to. So and there's no Mexicans in, in West Virginia. I mean, it's got the lowest percentage of foreign born people anywhere. Uh, of any of the 50 states. And so I began to think, uh, why is that? So I call up the cops, and they say, well, you got to call talk to the DEA in Columbus, because our guys were going up to Columbus to buy heroin and then coming back and selling it, and it was that heroin was killing all people down here, but they were getting it from Columbus. So I called DEA, and I mentioned to this guy, the supervisor, bless his heart, changed my life. Again, it's one of these moments, well, I'll never forget this. I was in my home office and this little hovel of a garage that I had, and I'm talking to this guy, and I say, you got heroin a lot in Columbus. I didn't think of her Columbus. And he stops me and goes, no, we never had heroin in Columbus before. Ten years ago when I came, 1999, 2000, he, he was referring to, we got this, all of a sudden these Mexicans start showing up, and they're selling heroin like, like pizza delivery, right? So there's a pizza delivery system that they have in which they have an operator standing by taking orders and you the addict will call from your a burger king or a speedway gas station wherever it is and they will deliver it to you they have all these drivers driving around columbus in this case with their mouths full of little tiny balloons tenth of a gram doses of black tar heroin looking like chipmunks or hamsters whatever big bottle of water next to them in case the cops stop them they swig it all down and they expel it later. And um, there, it's an amazing system. I've 25 years in the DEA, I've never seen anything like this. And he said, um, I, uh, um, and th th they never have guns. And I thought that was also amazing. They, they don't party, they don't look like Scarface or anything. They're, they're really low key. They all look like day, day workers in front of Home Depot. You know, that's how they dress. The cars are all 10-year-old cars. They want to look like they are migrants, you know, workers, and so on. Then he said something that changed my life. And then he said, he said, the craziest thing is, though, they're all from the same town. And I was, like, so prepared to hear that because 10 years in Mexico, traveling all over in my books about the popsicle guys and all that kind of stuff. And when he said that, I was leaning back like this, and I come like bolting forward, and I come on my feet, and I go, which town? Please tell me which town I'm praying, please tell me. And he comes back and he goes, Tepic. And you know, I knew he was wrong about that because the Tepic is a city, 350,000 people. It's the capital of the state of Nayarit, a small state that I'd never been to, but nevertheless, I knew it. And I knew that these, this method had to be from a small village. It could not be, a, a big town is not where you see this happen, where everybody w does the same job, right? So small towns, isolated. And I said, oh, oh, okay. I said, I took him at his word. He wasn't lying. He just said, this was the information he had. And then I began to write to all these guys and who are now in prison. A lot of they, we've arrested 20 of these guys and they keep on being more, keep on getting sent up. They're, the other guys are doing 10 years in prison and still people come working these, these, these crews. And I, I said, okay, do you have a list? And he gave me a list. People, I looked them up. They're all, in the, many of them were still in federal prison and I write to them. I must have written like 15, 20 letters in Spanish to these guys. Hey, do you want to talk about your pizza delivery system for selling black tar heroin retail? And I waited a month and nobody responded. And I was almost ready. Literally, I remember thinking this. I was almost ready to go um, on to another story, try to find something else to write about. And this guy calls. One of the guys calls me out of the blue. He says, from a federal prison, and he says, we have a long talk at that point. He says, yeah, uh, we're not from Tepic. We're from a little town nearby called Jalisco, the state of Nayarit. And from then on, it just, that's where I began, that began the dreamland book. 
I never would have started this book otherwise because I knew nothing about OxyContin. And, and uh, uh, um, I knew nothing about Vicodin, pain management, all that kind of stuff. All that stuff had happened when I was in Mexico. I didn't pay any attention to it. I didn't even know what OxyContin was when they, I first heard the name. I didn't know it was a painkiller. I didn't know it was an opioid. I didn't know what an opioid was. It's a, I mean, really nothing. What I knew was Mexico. Most people understand this story with the pills first, and then along comes heroin later. To me, I backed in. I was with the heroin first, and then, oh, and I'm writing about these guys in this town. I went to go down to this town. This town is like, in, for their August fiesta, it's like a convention of heroin dealers, my small level heroin, where everyone's kind of showing off their money, and everyone's bought, and I, like they have a parade of horses, and the horses are $20,000 horses. No way you're going to buy a $20,000 horse in Mexico unless you're working dope if you're at that level economically in the, in the scale of the, of the country. And there was a basketball tournament. Used to have a basketball tournament before heroin was a bunch of towns, little villages playing each other, ragtag uniforms and playing each other. And then all these guys got money, more money. They began to hire teams. And pretty soon by the time I'm there, they have full-on semi-pro Mexican basketball guys, 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, I met a guy from Memphis who was, was on one of these teams. They go play different places. They're not connected with drugs in this way, just that they were paid to come and play for this one, one village. Um, but as I was getting into that story, I could not answer the question of why was it that we were seeing so, why did they have a big growing market for heroin? And the reason, the reason I had that question was because, as I said, I didn't understand anything about OxyContin, and, and I, I stumbled on this as I was doing that story about those Mexican guys. Again, I kind of back into it, and then I realized that the much bigger story is the story that I didn't know anything about, which was pain pill prescribing, pill mills, pain docs, on and on and on that I know people in all of this region are just uh, way too uh, familiar with. And that was my learning curve. My learning curve was not immigrant Mexico or m drug trafficking Mexico. That was pretty easy. My learning curve was understanding what an Oxycontin was and how it affected the brain and how it came to be that we would have Oxycontin like, you know, everywhere that you'd be able to have almost like a currency. You could go trade them in for, uh, for dental work. You could trade them for uh, a cable TV service. You could, I mean, it was a remarkable thing that I began to see as I got into this, and that is what brought me, first of all, it brought me to Huntington, West Virginia, the heroin thing, but then I realized I'm onto a story that's so much bigger than I ever thought, because I could not understand why it would be that we would turn away t towards heroin again. I thought it was, we, in the 1970s, it wasn't that time when we figured out heroin was a real drag of a drug. Why would we get back into it? And now I understood, and it all made sense. I remember sitting in my office going, holy crap, look at that. That's a, and, and when you have a story like that that hits you like, oh, my God, kind of story, you had better not turn away from it. Uh, if you do, you, you probably should find another job, you know, like barista at Starbucks. or Because the truth is, those are the things, if, you don't, if, the, if, it, if it hits you here, and, and you could see, and I knew, I could see that nobody was really writing about this in a kind of a holistic way, like trying to tell the whole story. And so I end up writing, this is what leads to the book um, Dreamland. And I had this terrible time writing this book because nobody wanted to talk about it. That's why I put, the, 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 if you look at the subtitle, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic, Right? Why did they put opiate and not opioid? Because nobody knew what an opioid was back then. This was 2013-14, and not that long ago. Now we see it in headlines everywhere. But back then, when I turned this book in, there were three lawsuits against drug companies. Three. Now there's like, what, 2,600, 3,000? I don't even know how many. I've lost track. Billions of dollars being dislodged. I remember spending time when I was writing this book in this place called The Bottoms of Lucasville, Lucasville, Ohio. Uh, which is just north of the, of the Ohio River and into southern Ohio. And, and the bottoms is a place that floods a lot. There's a lot of, you know, there's the classic 
cars up on blocks and trailers and people who are in really, really bad shape, some from their own choices, others because of a lot of economic forces and sometimes a big combination of all of that. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, doing, that, doing this book right here, that, if, that nobody would ever be called to account for what had happened to neighborhoods like this because these people made lousy, really, really bad plaintiff defen uh, plaintiffs. You know, you put them on the stand, and they've, you, you know, you've been to jail, right? You ripped off your Christmas presents from your children, right? Yeah, you've be beaten your wife, right? Yeah, yes, yes. I mean, there's no jury that would ever find them appealing in, in, any, in any way. And I thought to myself, there's no chance that a major lawsuit could be built on these guys, on these people. But what happened after Dreamland came out, families, during what I was writing, families did not want to talk about it. Pa people with loved ones in their family who've been addicted, died in rehab, whatever it was, nobody wanted to, it was very difficult to find people who wanted to talk about it. If you remember the early days of the AIDS epidemic, some of you were old enough to remember that, you remember that the obituaries always, you know, they, they say, oh, he died of uh, cancer, whatever. Same with this, it was like he died of a heart attack. He died of a, uh, um, suddenly at home or something like that, you know? And, no, and so it, I, as a reporter, was in, felt myself, felt I was not expecting this. And I thought, my God, I'm in tough shape because if you can't get the people who most, can point, most poignantly can tell these stories to talk to you, you're gonna have something missing, right? You're gonna have something missing. Um, and I, luckily enough, I was able to find just enough to fill the book with the people that I needed from Ohio, a couple of folks from uh, Portland, there, Oregon, et cetera, thing, that kind of thing, and the, and the book came out, but I still was left with this feeling like there's no chance anyone's gonna read this book because nobody wants to talk about this. I saw, there's a, like a silence, nationwide silence. Nobody wanted to talk about it. But the amazing thing was when this book came out, at my, in my house, we lived this day and night. It was like day and a radically different almost overnight where all of a sudden the book comes out and all of a sudden we start getting people calling me, asking me to come speak, like to hear, right? Asking me to, you know, do interviews. And I'm like, I, after a while, I began to do these speeches all across the country. It was an amazing phenomenon. We were standing around in a daze in my house because I was certain, I told my wife, there's no chance this book's going to sell. No one's going to pay attention to it because no one wants to talk about this. And so as I began to um, I, as this book came out, 2015, then into 16, then 17, 18, it was staggering the amount of, of invitations, you know, that I got to speak. And the truth is, I didn't turn down very many of them. Because you know why? I had written two books that I think are fantastic and not, nobody read them. Okay? Once you've been through that, two books that nobody read but you think are great, well, Anytime someone says, hey, we want you to come speak, hell yeah, <laughs> I'm coming. You know, you can't avoid, you can't turn that down. And so it's, it's, it's almost embarrassing, although I, I'm proud of it too. But from, let's see, September 2015 until February of 2020, I did 265 speeches. That's an amazing amount of speaking. Um, I had a heart attack too along the way in Atlanta. Uh, survived due to some very, very good cardiologist in the Emory Hospital, not far away from the hotel where I was. Um, it was a wild time, and I, I as here, I, I didn't see America. I saw every Hampton Inn <laughs> in America, right? Sorry. There you go. The truth about Hampton Inns is they all look the same. All hotels really look the same once you're inside them. Uh, but um, I didn't see America. What I did see was Americans. and people that I had the opportunity to meet of all kinds, amazing, from like Vermont to Hawaii and l l almost every state in between. I think I didn't go to like 10 or 12 states. Um, but it was a remarkable experience for a journalist. The, the Senate Health Committee, Lamar Alexander from Tennessee, uh, was chair of it, put me on, had me testify. I mean, I was like, I mean, normally you're sitting all alone at a Senate table testifying before the uh, before senators. Usually, you're a mafioso, 
you know, or you're like a, a cabinet nominee who's about to be, have his dirty laundry spread all over C-SPAN at the very least. And um, here I was, just my wife and daughter, I'm like, and they're all telling me what a great guy I am and what a great book I wrote. And Tim Kaine says it's the best book I've ever read. And I'm like, ah, this is great. I got to do this every day, man. Come to invite me up next month. I'll be here. You know, um, it was just a surreal thing. But what it also did, and this is what was really important about this, was that it happened because all across America, people had been living, as I, as I felt when I was writing the book, people had been living in this kind of lacerating silence, right? All alone, a, a, an addicted loved one, or worse, a dead addicted loved one, and could be a, a son or a daughter, could be an uncle, could be a brother, grandfather, whatever it was, and they living with it as if they were the only ones in the country that had this problem. And then I think a big part of what happened was the book comes out and shows them, no, this is happening everywhere, and you thought you were all alone in a 10-mile radius? No, there's two people on your block. But nobody's talking about it. It was like this silence kept everyone thinking they were all alone and then also making huge mistakes. And then when the book comes out, this begins to grow. It's one of the great grassroots movements, political movements or social movements or whatever you want to call it, uh, of our time, except no one views it as such because there's no... Um, press secretary, there's no president of the union. I mean, it's just a very amorphous, vague thing, but, but that's how you get to 2,600 lawsuits because all of a sudden, politicians begin to feel this awakening. You know, oh my God, this is really important. Um, and all of a sudden, their priorities change. All of a sudden, this is an important priority and not just for people in Kentucky and West Virginia, but all across. You know, people on that Senate committee were from Vermont. They're from Virginia, they're from uh, uh, Oregon, I believe, Indiana, and so, so it was like all over, and you begin to feel policies change, discussion begins to become mo far more open. We have now, nobody knew how to pronounce naloxone when I was in, um, when I was writing this book. Very few people. President Obama didn't know how to pronounce it, you know, and that's because nobody knew anything about it. The whole country was in the dark about this thing, and now that has changed, and that's what Dreamland did. And I'm very, very, very proud um, of that. I watched it happen in real time. It happened to me both before when it was deathly si silent and then afterwards when people were battering. You know, I, one week I got nine invitations to come speak. I had to turn three or four of them down. I th I maybe even four or five of them down because I, th they were all, uh, those dates were already committed and stuff, you know. It was a remarkable thing. We were wandering around in a daze for five years in my house, because we, I was certain, my wife was certain, there was no chance this was ever gonna happen. Along the way then, um, my immersion in this topic, and then I did learn about pain management, I did learn about pill mills, I did learn about pain as the fifth vital sign and all the stuff that led to this, under, this bizarre idea in American medicine that we could prescribe opioid painkillers derived from the opium poppy wantonly for almost anything and they would not be addictive and that it would be a good idea to that's the way you should treat pain now in america pushed by pharmaceutical companies pushed certainly also very importantly by certain pain doctors pain specialists and we get to this bizarre idea which i think we already kind of view it as weird but i think 50 years from now we'll, we'll the historians will look back on that period um, of historians of medicine or medical history or whatever and look at it the same way. You know how they used to put leeches on our body to suck all the bad blood out of our... I mean, that's kind of way we look and go, oh my God, that's so backward. Yeah, they're going to look on this as the same thing. It's like weird. Not that opioids are bad in and of themselves. It's how that you use them. They're actually magnificent drugs surgically. They're actually wonderful drugs and if you use them within certain limitations <laughs> and not sending massive amounts of, of refills home with people just on their say-so and, and, and regardless, you know. So it's, it, it became this amazing thing. But along the way, then, that led to this book. Because as I did, the, as I traveled and as I spoke, when my, my publisher, I should say, first of all, was saying, oh, man, you got to write another book about this. And I was like, first of all, I was exhausted. Like, you cannot, my, my little brain just could not handle any more stuff. 
right? Any more data, any more interviews, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, no, no, you got to, you know, and I said, well, but then I said something that I, uh, amazes me to this day, but it's an important thing. And I was thinking old school, like an old school crime reporter, right? I was thinking, Dreamland says it all. What could be worse than heroin? Right? Remember, there was a time when we never thought that there was anything worse than heroin. You remember those years? You know, that's how I was feeling, too. And then along the way, I begin to see, I get a real-time view of what could be worse than heroin, and that is fentanyl. And of course, too, I have to say, really, it's not just fentanyl. It's the transition of the Mexican trafficking world, who's like taken over for the doctors. The doctors created all this. Huge supplies of pills nationwide, like un unprecedented opioids, coast to coast, because all the doctors have been pushed or eagerly convinced or whatever that this is a good way of treating pain. And they, and they begin to prescribe, and it, prescriptions take off like this, never stop for, for 15 years, something like that. And they just, and, and, and so we get this enormous supply. And then there's this awakening that I talk about, and people know what an opioid is now, and know what naloxone is, and pretty soon attorneys general are, are, are filing lawsuits with subpoena power, which is something a, 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 a drug company better take note of. And, and all these attorneys general file lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all this stuff happens. You know, and it's, and, and, and people are become aware, and then doctors cut back, and then it's like the Mexican trafficking world says, we'll take it from here. And they have transitioned away. See, when I was in Mexico, for a lot of those years, I viewed most traffickers really as farmers because the trafficking world in Mexico was all rooted in the land, growing poppies or marijuana. That was, I mean, that's initially what they were. They were just kind of ranchers or farmers. But now what you've seen is that they have transitioned to global traders of chemicals, Chemi chemical entrepreneurs, criminal chemical entrepreneurs, and, and they have transitioned to synthetic drugs. And that means that it's not just fentanyl, it's also methamphetamine. And the methamphetamine supplies and the fentanyl supplies in an unprecedented way are coming in together. You've seen people use both. I'm sure you've seen this in your areas which before was never the case. So you used meth or you used heroin. That was it. You did not mix at all. It was a radical thing to see that change. Um, and and, and uh, the potency now is beyond anything. The supplies are enormous, but the potency is so high, too, that it's, first of all, fentanyl, of course, killing people right and left all across this country. Methamphetamine is doing another thing, though, and that is the potency of the drug the way it's so potently produced down in Mexico is driving people to mental illness, to uh, 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 symptoms of schizophrenia, very serious hallucinations, completely realistic hallucinations. You cannot convince a person that there are not cheetahs coming out of the walls, right? Um, uh, a paranoia of an intense, any black car that passes got to be a FBI agent coming from me. Right? It's a scary thing, creating homelessness. All across this country really believe the fentanyl, the, um, pr well, particularly the methamphetamine is a major driver now of homelessness. It's a major driver of tent encampments because the last place you want to be when you're homeless is in a homeless shelter where everybody else is like all there and you know, screaming and, and, and they're threatening you because everything's threatening you now that you're on, that you're on meth and all this. And, um, um, uh, uh, and, and, and convincing you that, that everyone's out to, out, out to get you. So, but tent encampments are a perfect place if you're on meth. Because you're addicted to meth, you gotta have it. And everybody in the tent encampment, but, but the tents are little pods where you can retreat from the world that is now horribly scary and threatening. You know? And so a lot of this begins, people wanna say a lot of homelessness has to do with affordable housing, and affordable housing has something to do with it, but I believe a major driver in all this and you can see it as the meth particularly marches across the country beginning in 2011, 12, 13 when they first hits the United States, this in super potent meth that they begin to produce down in Mexico. It hits LA, it hits Phoenix, Vegas, et cetera, et cetera, the West Coast, and, and it hits here in these regions. I don't know about exactly here, but I think when I was in uh, Lexington and Northern Kentucky, it was about 2017 when it begins to really hit West Virginia. I know Clarksburg, West Virginia, which is in this book, 
uh, I'm sorry, The Least of Us, which is in The Least of Us, it hit there about 2016, 17 as well, spring of 2017. It very quickly creates all this homelessness in places that never had any homelessness. Don't have high cost of housing. You know, Clarksburg, West Virginia does not have that. Anyway, this is all about um, the, the, the overarching idea, though, that I want to talk about in my writing, and I'll end up here. If you have any questions, feel free to just fire away. Um, is immersion. There is, we live in a society where it's believed to be okay to skim the surface on everything, you know? Like everything needs to, you, you could, you know, on, on the internet you could find out about anything pr presumably, you know, in five minutes. And, and everybody becomes an expert on climate change, on this, on that, on a million other things. My feeling is good writing and e exciting journalism, this kind of journalism that really makes you want to go, my God, this is the most fun job I've ever had, and I've felt like that for 35 years, is immersion. Getting into a topic deeply, going way down, doing interviews with people um, six, seven times so they can't, wait, can't, can't stand the side of you. Like, I, here it comes again, <laughs> oh my God, let me, I'll tell them I can't, there was something. You know, that kind of thing. And it's immersion that leads us to great writing, I think. I have believed that I can't write until I'm fully immersed. If I can't write, it's because I haven't talked to enough people. You know, it's such an important thing. And, and, um, but also the beauty of it is that as I got into it, particularly these books, these two top, these two books here, um, it, it reminded me of why I love being a journalist. First of all, you tell amazing stories. Second of all, you can have enormous impact. But third, and, and I guess what most pushes me, all these things are very, very important, was the simply the ability to get out and see and meet people all across the country and in Mexico that I never have an opportunity to meet otherwise. And this, it, it's an enriching way of living, but you have to devote yourself to the immersion, the immersive aspect of it. Because if you don't, you'll never really know enough to, to write about it well, I don't think. And you'll never be in, it, it will never inspire you because superficial stuff doesn't really inspire. You gotta dig down deep. And that is kind of the motto of my career that I think that I think about it, that, um, you know, he always did nine interviews when one would have sufficed kind of thing. Yeah, that's the way to be, uh, I think, a journalist in this. And, and I think it's a radical idea in this country where every journalist on, it changes your mind, you know. It, it, it's a radical idea because in, in, every journalist we ever see now is so, f never changes his or her mind. You never see anybody on Fox News or CNN go, well, my goodness, what you have said is very persuasive and is now leading me to change everything I once thought about X, subject X. No, never happens. That's sad. That's very sad. We change our minds as people all the time, and I find that to be an immensely human thing to do, and I find that to be what you should be doing if you're, if you're serious about your journalism. Unfortunately, uh, on, on cable TV news, you don't see it that much. Anyway, I'll end there. Thank you very, very much for listening to me. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to just do my best to answer whatever questions you might have. Fire away. Well, I listen I way too much punk rock when I was in high college, <laughs> and so I can't, I have, I literally I have hearing aids, but sometimes it still is too echoey. It, what, what made me think? So, yeah, why did you think you couldn't write poems in Spanish? That I could not? Yeah. Oh, because it seemed to be, you know, uh, something for the big guys to do, and, and, and these people who work for these prestigious magazines, like the New Yorker, oh my God, I could never do that, you know. And it was, it, so it took a place where I had ample access to amazing stories like Mexico and a lot of freedom, which was the case because I was a freelancer. I, was, I wasn't wealthy. I was making like 20,000 bucks a year, you know, almost nothing. 
but it was, um, it, I did have freedom. I, could, and I didn't have a boss calling me from Atlanta or from D.C. telling me, no, you got to do go over here and do this story over there. And I was like, hell no. I got twice offers to work in that way, and I turned them down both times. I, at that point, I realized this is not, it's not worth it. They pay me this steady salary, but I'm having more fun. And I was, you know, I was ferociously single, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. So, you know, and I, I, I would buy occasionally house plants, and then I stopped because I'd go off for three weeks and they'd die. They constantly die, you know, because I was off doing my thing on some bus in some funky little part of Mexico where I would just show up and start talking and everyone would just go, what's, what's with the gringo, you know? And, but so in time, you get the, and, and then occasion, a, a couple of times early on, I had some pretty good editors at magazines that helped and made me feel like, yeah, this is, this is possible. And then after a while, I, balance, I, I, I kind of mastered the balance between writing short for money and doing the long-term stuff. Uh, not always for money, but I needed to be making money, like, d you know, monthly. And then I would work on some long thing that might take three months that where I wouldn't see a paycheck for maybe even three months later after that, because they don't pay until publication, you know what I mean? So it was a, but, but in time I realized it was, a, it was the most exciting way to live. You know, you're writing about all kinds of stuff. And, and then some of these stories really began to pop. They be, be, people began to get like really good response, I began to get good response to that, and that kind of buoyed my confidence, and uh, so I just, you know, part of it, a big part of, 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 of any proceeding in any career is confidence, right? You don't think you can do it, you don't think, and then you've learned that, yeah, actually, you know what, you can. It's not that hard, or, or you're at a point where it's not hard. Maybe 10 years earlier would have been very, very difficult, but now, kind of, I've done enough. I'd had, f I'd had four years in Stockton writing four stories a day, Again, when I left that, I was like, man, I can do anything now. You know, it's like great training, which is not, the problem is today's journalists, they don't get that kind of training. It's like, it's a very sh kind of shredded atmosphere in many newsrooms, and, and you don't get really good editing. Sometimes the editors aren't much older than you are, and you need, I need, I had an editor in Stockton, all kind of scraggly hair, scraggly beard, was like a marine sergeant, this guy. This stinks. Did you write this? My God, this thing needs, you know. And I'd be like this kind of gung-ho, sir, yes, sir, it stinks. You know, I'll never do it again, you know, kind of thing. Because all I wanted to be was a good writer. And I do remember, I can tell you this, uh, Justin. Um, I remember one day, about four or five months into my job, I had wrote, written a story. It was on the front page of the, of the paper. And he walks up, and he goes, did you write that? And I'm like, oh my god, he's going to, in front of everybody, he's going to just tear me up. And, he go, and I go, yeah? I'm like, uh, what? What? <laughs> you know? And he goes, and he hits his desk, my desk like this, and goes, now that's what I'm talking And I could tell you, I was like, felt like crying and laughing, and I was high the entire day because I'd spent so much effort trying to be better, trying to learn from people who had been in journalism for a good number of years, like he had been. And he was the best, he was one of the best editors I ever had, that guy. Unfortunately, I only was able to work from, with him for about a year. Um, but man, it, when he told me that, I was like, Oh, you know, this kind of elation, like finally I get to a point where I can actually say I'm, I'm writing a news story the right way. Was, the story was short. It was like 10 inches, you know, it was like that long. That's it. But he comes and goes, that's the way to go. Man, that, wor that helped. That's, that's, yeah. anyway, all that led to eventually the feeling I could, I could, I could do this in the long run. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, here's the thing. I got into journalism I, because I was interested in almost anything. It gives you like this license. They should just print it up. He can ask you anything he wants to about any topic, so just answer him. You know, basically that's kind of what journalism is. So you, I work for 
You know, I say, I tell people I'm a freelance writer, which, which could be a big crock, you know? And, and oh, okay, sure, fine, what questions do you have? You know, kind of thing. But I, they also look me up and they can see I've got a lot of resumes, so. Anyway, what I'm going with this is that I never signed up to be Mr. Dope, <laughs> right? I was pulled into this and I love, love deeply these two books. I'm very proud of their impact. I'm very proud of the stories that they tell because nobody was telling these stories. Now, when, I, when, when Dreamland, when my agent went to, uh, took my book proposal that would later become Dreamland to, a, to newspaper, uh, to, I'm sorry, book publishers in New York City, a dozen or so, one, only one wanted a book. This was 2012, right? Right? So after Dreamland comes out, it's the other thing. There's 2,600 new lawsuits, but there's also like the, a long line of books lining up to be published on this very topic, all of which came after Dreamland, okay? So it created a whole new genre and topic. So I'm very, very proud of all that, but I did not end up, be, I did not want to become the guy who writes only about dope. I just, I've seen in addiction journalism that there are journalists out there who have been, in, who are in recovery themselves from drugs, and they don't write about anything but that. And my feeling is, no, I don't, I think journalism is so much more interesting, I want to write about everything. So, that's a preface to what I'm going to tell you, which is that the next, perhaps, okay, no, let me say this, perhaps, I'm not sure, I'm still working on this idea, okay? And let me, let me preface it by, let me, let me say, let me ask you this question. Do you not, that, and this will be the next thing I'm, I hope, I, I may work on. And do you not find it a fascinating fact that the entire history of human innovation when it comes to musical instruments, going back to the caveman days, but certainly in the last two, three hundred years, industrial design, et cetera, et cetera, that in the last, all these centuries of innovation that we have only, as a, hu as a humankind, we have only been able to produce two perfect tubas. <laughs> I know, well, and well you should, young lady. <laughs> <laughs> I got into this, and so I, I think I want to write a, something completely different, except for it's not that different. I'll tell you in a little bit why not. But tubas, the most, you know, relegated of all the instruments. You guys start laughing. Everybody starts laughing. The way most people j play the tuba is that they're late for band class in seventh grade, first day. Every, all the other instruments are taken, you get the tuba. Seriously, literally, that's how it, how it happens, you know. Um, but I love writing about people. I don't write about instruments. I don't write about dope. I write about people who use dope or people who play instruments, whatever. I love writing about people particularly, and I've done this in other stories in, for the LA Times and so on, people who are obsessed with creating something for the love of that creation. Not because they're gonna get filthy rich, they're gonna play the super real halftime show, they're gonna be influencers on YouTube or wherever the hell, it's because they just love it. And the tuba is where you find that and the, uh, uh, in a, in very intensely. The people who stick with the tuba become professionals are in love with that deep sound. It's almost like that sound kind of get some right here and all those molecules in your gut just go whoa you know um, the interesting thing is if you think about addiction what is addiction addiction is the obsession with finding happiness through a foreign substance through buying something that will make you happy it's about absolute obedience to immediate gratification it's about the lack of discipline or, or um, uh, 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 collaboration with others, very isolating. It's a lack of preparation for anything, you know? So at the polar opposite of all of that, of the drug addict, is the tuba player, right? Tuba player 
is about nothing but postponement of immediate gratification. For a long time now, it's changing, but girls never would go out with a tuba player, right? You know, there's um, years of preparation. You really only make sense when you're, as a musician, most musicians feel this too, but with tuba especially, you only make sense when you're playing with other people. It's a collaborative enterprise, right? You're not, it's about postponing gratification for those few moments. Now, the addict seeks immediate gratification based on the promise that will never be fulfilled, which is that you will find that high the first, that equals the first time you ever used the dope you're using. Never will happen. Never, okay? But with music, you do find that. It just needs a lot of preparation and hard work and all that. And so you find, I actually have come to realize that what I'm writing about is simply the opposite of what I was writing about in these two books. Now, I'm still not sure I'm going to do what I'm going to do with this, but I've been interviewing tuba players like crazy, <laughs> okay? And <laughs> what's that? I was not. I was not, I can't even remember who the tuba player was in my high school. <laughs> when I was growing up, everybody wanted to play the guitar. I play the guitar, it, but here's the thing. I got onto this because in LA, I was writing about a lot of things having to do with the Mexican immigrant community there. And I wrote a story about how popular the tuba was because it's like marching band music and dance music with marching band instruments is a really big deal in Mexico. And as, as, as an, a lot of immigrants took to hiring bands for like backyard birthdays or weddings or whatever kinds of parties. <laughs> and the, only, the way you show that you were, have arrived is by having a band, a small band, three, four people, but one of them is a tuba. And people throw the tips in the bell and it get all soggy with saliva and later on you gotta pour it all out. But, but it's like this thing, it was this thing. And then I published that story, front page, the LA Times, 2011. Okay, immediately, immediately, I begin getting calls from band directors who say, do you know that we are now in a, in a huge plague of tuba thefts from our high schools? We're all getting our tubas ripped off. People would rip off the tubas. They would never steal the trumpets or the computers or, the dr or any of that stuff. They just take the tubas. And this went on for about six months. SNL, Saturday Night Live, I wrote that story too. Saturday Night Live on their weekend edition wrote a little joke about um, there's a huge rash of tuba thefts in California. In other news, people have been able to figure out how to smoke marijuana using a tuba. Okay, that's, <laughs> Seth, that's on SNL 2011. You can look it up. <laughs> Seth Meyers. Um, so I got into, I, I began, I love writing about subcultures, people who don't, who are just obsessed with, devoted to something, creating something, not devoted to child molestation, but devoted to creating something positive and, and creative and an expression of the great best of humanity, you know? And I began to realize this, and so I began to call all these tuba players, you know? And it just hasn't stopped. I put the tuba stories on hold to do Dreamland and then to do this, uh, the least of us, but it's always been in the back of my mind and my agent loves it as a story. And so I said, okay, well, let me see if I can, and, and I've been talking with tuba players now, and there's, it's too much to talk about right now. I'm not even sure I'm actually going to be able to find enough for a book on it, but it's, it's just something that you, if, if you don't, if I don't do this, I'll spend the rest of my life going, I wonder if there was ever a book in that tuba story, you know what I mean? So, but all of this is really comes from the idea that I'm not a journalist to write about drugs. People know me because of these two books now. Right, and that's fine, and that's great, and I'm very happy, and I'm here because of that, you know, all that kind of thing. But, man, there's more to journalism, there's more to life than writing about one topic, and I, will, I don't want to be penned in, you know? And so, um, I'm thinking, you know, and there's, this, th there's, there's two perfect tubas in the world, literally true. They both are owned by the Chicago Symphony. They were made by a company called York and Sons in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1930s as prototypes. They were not um, mass produced. They have perfect tune. They have perfect, their, their overtones are in perfect tune with all the instruments of the orchestra up to the piccolo, which is what gives Chicago Symphony 
what I, I did not know this before that I do all this, but now I'm going to tell you that the, the Chicago brass section, which is tuba, trumpet, French horn, trombone, is like the most renowned brass section in the world. Um, has the, there's a thing called the Chicago Sound, but it's powered by that these these tubas. The pro, and they have been trying to replicate these tubas for 30 years. No one's ever been able. Yamaha tried a couple of companies. They've come close, pretty close, but but it's like no one's ever been able to be, repl replicate a Stradivarius violin either. You know. And it, I think also fascinating is that this company, Grand, uh, 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 York and, and Sons in Grand Rapids, it had this, it was opened, I think, in the late 1890s or something like that. It goes back to the previous century, uh, changed ownership, and, but it, then it got this foreman who was like apparently a genius, just a masterfully well-trained artisan. And he assembled all these other artisans who all learned, or maybe they you know, they just kind of learned on the job, probably. And it strikes me that this was one of the most innovative workshop, musical instrument workshops, like, ever assembled. And nobody knows their names. You know, I was reading, if you read a book about, when you're a journalist, you read all kinds of stuff that you don't think have, has anything to do with each other. But they all, some, sometimes they all kind of act. I was reading a book about uh, th the writing of the King James Bible. You know, and we don't know a thing about anybody who wrote the King James Bible, except for the King James commissioned it. There's a couple of leading religious lights of that era who, who came together. And then, but there's all these priests and everybody that, that, that wrote that and wrote parts of it. And we don't have a clue who they are. Their names are completely lost to history. The same is true of the York, I think, I think, I'm not sure. But I think the same is true of the York a sh workshop in Grand Rapids in the 1930s because in 1942 uh, war requisitions it was transformed into a munitions factory like many of those brass instrument companies were so they're making compasses and bullets and tank shields or whatever else you know but they aren't making and so they lost that and we really have never recovered our preeminence in musical instrument construction post World War II it all went to Germany or Japan, ironically enough, our enemies, you know, but, and, and China now, of course, too, and some others. But we don't really quite have it anymore. So, so anyway, um, you asked. <laughs> <So> <laughs> when you ask that, I know, I'm like, man, in 10 minutes, this guy's going to be going, won't this guy shut the hell up about the two of it? Uh, uh, I think one of his names is Chestnut Brown, and he's I'm, I'm sorry, what's that? Anyone's ever thought that <laughs> up, you know? <laughs> wow, that's a new one. Wow. I did have um, one other uh, part to this question as well, if you don't mind. Uh, it goes back to your writings. Uh, what would you say are the great differences between writing a David Fine story and writing narrative for the first time? Can you hear what? Well, mainly with that, you need you need to focus on, with with narrative journalism. You're always think you're always focusing on on um, people, on creating characters so the characters can 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 carry the story. With crime stories, frequently you don't have that because it's a daily thing. You've got to get it out now. You figure it out later. You'll write more later, maybe. But but there, it's not like you can spend a lot of time trying to, you now, sometimes you get lucky. I did this one story where um, there was this guy shot at a traffic light. Cameron was a Mexican guy. Um, I didn't know a thing about him, I had a name. And then um, spent the rest of the day trying to find out more about him, couldn't do it. And then finally went to the, went to the um, hospital where he was essentially, you know, still alive, but brain dead, that kind of thing. And outside the hospital was his son, who at first got very mad. Oh, you blood-sucking journalist. And I said, man, stop. That's not who I am. I'm trying to tell a story about your dad. Now tell me who he was. And it turns out, this is what you get. You get lucky when you push and when you, you know, put an effort in. This guy was called, he had a, um, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, a, 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 an act called uh, Tijuana Elvis. 
and he would play Elvis person impersonations, do Elvis impersonations in Spanish at weddings and backyard barbecues and birthdays and all that kind of stuff. And nobody knew him by his name. But as soon as I put Tijuana Elvis, people had seen this guy, many, he was, had a pretty good business and people had seen him do his Tijuana Elvis, hound dog in Spanish, all that kind of thing for many years and so oh my god Tijuana Elvis was killed you know people all across this town were like oh my god remember that guy we saw three years ago at so-and-so's wedding you know and so there are times when character is important when you can find out information but the problem is the daily nature of things means you've just got to get it quick you got to get it right because people read that stuff like I said that guy was his brother called up and said why don't you have my brother in your crime people read that stuff very closely you better have it right and then what I would always do in Stockton was I would do those stories and then I would always keep notes and then see if I could follow up later. And sometimes I could, and so I'd do longer, some longer stories. And a lot of times it's just, you get what you get, and if people don't want to talk to you, then later on they regret it. I tried to tell people, you're going to regret you didn't talk to me two months from now, a year from now. And they did regret it, you know. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously, Alfie Khan came out, and it was past, past that, and then Finn came out. And yeah. Now it's our turn, our turn. Do you think, in the same way that when you drop something from up high, it finally reaches a terminal velocity, you know, do you think there's anything like that for, for us? I mean, will we ever just max out and that, okay, we're not, we're, we're too, we're either we wise up and we stop making things more powerful, or. Well, you know, may, maybe. <laughs> it's hard to say on that. I mean, I think. I think that what fentanyl has done, though, has cured a lot of people of the urge to use drugs recreationally. Because the truth is, fentanyl means you can't use drugs recreationally anymore. You've got to just, you know, because you could die. It's a Russian roulette, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I don't, I think there will always, there's a whole bunch of chemical, you know, synthetic drugs out there in, in, in the vaults, in the chemistry literature and in the, the vaults of chemical companies who, who, were, who were playing around with this one drug trying to see if they can make it commercially work and never could, and so they said, okay, forget it. You know, I'm gonna go on to something else. And, but it's still out there, it's there in the literature. You could read it, anybody could read it if they know how to navigate the chemistry literature, and a lot of those guys, those drug cartels are employing people like that, you know, so. Um, I just think that it's, it may be a time when we learn the proper lessons from our drug addiction epidemics. Uh, one of them is there's no such thing as re recreational drug use anymore. Number two, though, I think is that, that these things start because we have shredded community in all across this wealthy, wealthy towns, uh, lower income towns, whatever. It, it's, you know, Appalachia, Rust Belt, parts of New Mexico, Maine, you know, it's, uh, you know it, it, and as Orange County and Fort Lauderdale, too. You know, you go there and you're just like, wow, well, who lives here, you know, kind of thing. And so uh, that's one thing I think really needs to, we need to understand that, that we need to f work back towards repairing community, repairing the, 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 the towns and the and places we've been. And then also I would say this, and that's how I got the title for this book, The Least of Us, because I'm not a Christian, but I was reading the Bible when I was writing this book. And um, Book of Matthew, that what you do for the least of these, my brethren, do for me. I think we've gotten far, far away from that idea. That Jesus understood the importance of community. He understood that if you just start saying, well, I'm not going to care about this brother and that brother and the, uh, these brethren, etc., then I'm going to, um, then we will, he understood that, 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 that you, we cannot have a healthy society that way, you know. And um, I think also g g gathered on this title as well because it felt to me like we had gotten into this because we wanted magic, massive answers to our very complicated problems, right? So you have, um, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, one pill for every pain kind of thing, right? And, it's, and I think that the small, the least little effort is kind of where this, the solutions lie. It's at the local level, daily showing up. People who show up and work and do the small things just try to make things a little bit better, not worrying if it's not saving the world because it's not in some immediate way, but in the long run, that's the only way real, important social change has happened without uh, massive unintended consequences, like the pills and all the consequences that they we're not still living with. So um, that's kind of my, I guess this is my feeling about both these books, that they're, this is a learning time. We, we, we need to understand what the lessons are of these. This, epidemic of addiction, because now it's just simply that, I think. No longer just opioids. And, um, and I think that that is really so important, that we need to understand that, 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 that those lessons are there for us to learn. It's turning away from, you know, Fox News and CNN and all that alarmist outrage crap. We don't have it in my house. We need to turn that crap right off, right? And every time I go to Hampton Inn, I turn on CNN or Fox News, I go, well, that's why I don't have it anymore. <laughs> These guys are idiots, you know? It. It's all good stuff. What I see from it, it they'll, 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 they keep switching topics. They talk about one, one thing for three or four seconds, then they switch to another thing. Yeah, and do you know what it's like to be on those shows? It's the, anything going on. Here, here's what it's like, okay? You go into a closet, yeah. like not much larger than a closet. You sit on a a short stage on a chair, stage is about six to eight inches high, on a chair, they put this thing in your ear, they turn down the lights, they blast you with light, they have a green screen behind and then they show some picture of whatever town you're from. So if it's LA, the downtown LA, and then you talk into a box and all you hear was, you don't see anybody, you're talking to a black box, right. which is, contains a camera which actually you can't even see. You know, it's like there's this box and then there's in deep into it, there's a camera. And, and they, they ask you these questions and it's the most, and yeah, as you say, it goes from like three, four, five minutes a topic and then you're done. And I'm like, so I, I stopped doing it. Like CNN, to get to CNN in LA, you gotta wait, brave like three traffic jams. I'm like, I'm gonna drive all over there, three traffic jams to be on your show for five minutes? I don't, no. That's not going to happen, you know. So I stopped doing it, and um, and uh, and or they want you to wait. Fox News called the other day, and I'm like, "Can you get up at four in the morning?" I right there, I cannot do that now, <laughs> you know, because we go on at five and blah blah blah. So anyway, but th what you say is absolutely correct. They 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 and and the other thing is, not only do they spend a little time on it, the anchors don't know a thing about the topic. They're all. Mediocre. Half the time, you know, reading it is two to four minutes because the television divide doesn't make them from a teleprompter. I mean, I don't know. I guess, you know, the truth is, I don't know, but I'm sure that there's some of that going on because I've never been in a studio with them. I've always been in those closets. That's, what, that's, what, that's my experience. If you are not in Atlanta or New York, um, or sometimes LA, but I think mostly it's Atlanta or New York, you are going to be, you are somewhere else in a closet. And, and, and then they want you to answer these questions, like ridiculously large questions, like, how did we get here, Sam? <laughs> like, well, I wrote a book, you know, it's like a few hundred pages, you might want to read that, you know, it's just, there's no, there's no attempt to, there's no, what I'm saying is, journalism is about informing people, but there's no information, there's no informing on those shows. And that's why we just said, done. No more paying to watch CNN and Fox News and all the others. And the truth is, I, I know one's from the right and one's from the left, but the truth is they're all the same in very important ways, mainly because they're all selling the, in, the, the message of each of those stations and others, but this, just talking about those two, is you're right, they're bad. That's the message. It's not you're right, but they have a point. Or you're right and they're wrong, but you can argue, blah, blah, blah. No, it's, you're right, they're bad people because of what they believe. That's overwhelming what they're selling. And it's, they're, they're selling it, though, I stopped watching any of that crap. You can't learn anything from, and, unless it's like some 
really serious breaking news. I was putting breaking, breaking, it's not breaking news. Breaking news is when you have a, you know, something that's really big. Uh, so anyway, yes, ma'am. Did I say that I hadn't? No, no, I was just fascinated by your story about the Mennonite. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say that I got over my fear of tall, blonde-haired men, uh, which was a serious thing for several months. Um, uh, I was, uh, because I was writing the story, I, did not, I, I wrote the story, and in my book, it's the only story I've ever wrote where I was the main figure. I never write about me. You know what I mean? Or rarely, I have uh, two or three times, but that's one of the, that's the last time I ever did it, in fact, uh, so far. And um, I mean, to, any, to that kind of degree. And so um, I, I, it, I was writing the story, the putting together the last chapter, it was going to be the last chapter in that book, and I was like, you know, it just brought back these intense memories for months. And, and then I remember several times my heart would begin to race like really race when I'd see a tall blonde. And of course these guys were in there buying their lattes. They don't know what the hell I'm thinking, you know? And of course I didn't do anything. I just pushed myself back from the chair, put my computer to a side. Do I need to launch, leap over this table and grab you by the throat and strangle you because you're about to kill me? No, okay, good, you know, so. You feel like you're getting chased by people that look similar to Harry Potter? I love the young men that guys look like Harry Potter. These were blonde-haired guys, um, and uh, you know the interesting thing about Mennonites was that they, um, if they're legitimate farmers, they don't ha care about what their hair looks like. They're farmers. This guy had like perfect. One guy pulled up to me next to me, and and uh, I was at a stoplight, and he was the last car following me, and he gets looks at me like this, and he smiles this menacing smile. And he reaches down on the well of his truck and he pulls out, this was a 2003, you know, those digital cameras, remember? You know? and, and he pulls out a digital camera, starts taking my picture like that. And I'm like freaking out. I mean, my, I'm freaking out. And I put my, I, I got some pieces of paper, like blank pieces like this, and I put it up in front of my face so he can't take my picture, except for that I'm shaking so much that it's ridiculous. The paper is going like that. It was like embarrassing, you know? And I eventually got out of that by going to the cops and stuff, but it was, um, it was scary as hell. Anyway, thank you all very, very much. If you want me to sign a book or two, feel free. I appreciate y'all coming out. Thank you very much. There's uh, my cards and uh, bookmarks too. Feel free to have at it.